Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. So, Trump's travel ban. Do you remember earlier in the year, uh, just after the inauguration, he tried to bring in a travel ban? Well, actually, he tried to extend one that, in fact, Barack Obama had been already put in place. Uh, but it led to a huge row and an accusation that, effectively, it was a Muslim ban. Well, that's all changed because there are now countries on the ban list, uh, including Venezuela, for argument's sake, that are not, by any means, majority Muslim countries. Six of the eight countries are, two of them aren't. But there is an attempt to bring back uh, this travel ban. It doesn't completely exclude people from those countries. There are exemptions, but during the months it's been in operation, 700 travellers were detained and 60,000 visas were provisionally revoked but we now have a judge in maryland and indeed a judge in hawaii saying this can't go ahead i don't want to focus too much on the u.s side of this argument other than to say i think the battle lines are very clear trump believes he's fulfilling his promise to the electorate and genuinely making america safer but the judges think that it's discriminatory and there's no evidence that it will stop terrorism. They are the battle lines. But if we take that in a UK context, remember that yesterday we talked about the Director General of MI5, Andrew Parker, telling us that he's facing an intense challenge from terrorism. There is more terrorist activity coming at us more quickly and it will be harder to detect. So some pretty grim words that we got from Andrew Parker. And I'm asking you tonight that... Would you, in line with what Trump's trying to do, support a tougher vetting regime in the United Kingdom for people coming from certain parts of the world? If you think it would be utterly ridiculous to adopt a travel ban, well, you can call me on 0345 6060973. Maybe you think with a global terror threat we can't be too careful, in which case text on 84850. Or maybe you think Trump actually has been unfairly treated over this, in which case tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. Watch me on Facebook. Comment there. I'm here live in Los Angeles. Um, worth pointing out, I think, at this stage of the debate, that most of the attacks that we've seen in the United Kingdom this year uh, actually have come from homegrown terrorist people, in many cases born in the United Kingdom, who've been radicalised in the United Kingdom. But that doesn't stop the argument that controlling borders is important. And when you see the fact that five of the eight people that committed those that awful atrocity in Paris had come back into Europe, posing as migrants across the Mediterranean, frankly, we can't be too careful. I guess we're going to get some strong opinions on this. And Chris in Blackheath is my first caller. Chris, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Um, let's bear in mind, though, that if you to increase the vetting, then why don't you just increase the vetting for everybody? Banning in a country makes no sense. It's not, it's not countries that are evil. It's, peop it's individual people that do e evil deeds. As you saw yourself in Vegas, that wasn't anybody that had come from another country. That had happened within Vegas. And I know you like, you know, pulling up borders and building walls yourself. I know that you get on really well with Donald Trump. But the fact is, you've got to admit that um, it would be better to actually come down on the internet companies, the social media, to make sure that they're doing what they're doing properly, to use uh, GCHQ intelligence services a lot more harshly rather than um, just saying to everybody, oh, you can't travel to this country. What well, your point, Chris, about building walls... Um, and, yeah, that's the two sides of the argument, isn't it? You know, we say we want proper border controls, and the other side accuse us of wanting to pull up drawbridges and build walls. Had you noticed, Chris, we've been building walls in London. We've built walls along the bridges in central London. So you can't say there's not an intense terrorist threat, and it does come from a variety of sources. But how, surely, Chris, you would think, would you not, that people coming into the United Kingdom, you know, from Iraq, may pose a bigger terrorist threat than those coming from Canada? Well, Nigel, um, you're trying to generalise a little bit and uh, oversimplify the situation. If you were to raise the, the, the bar for everybody, so everybody was vetted highly, then you wouldn't be discriminating against the people. Yeah. But just right. I say, if you if, if you're saying okay, let's discriminate or let's let's let everybody coming in from somewhere like Iraq, 
uh, hierarchies. I know Iranians. I know English people. I know American people. Just like you do. You, yeah, but, there, so, but there are countries, there are countries in which, for example, ISIS is very active. Should we not be slightly more careful with those countries? But wouldn't you say, though, that, um, that rather than them sending someone across the world to do their evil deed, they just put their hand in the back pocket and do it through the internet? And that's what I, the problem I is. Don't, I don't disagree with you. We've got a problem with the internet. We've got a huge problem with our prisons in this country. There are lots of ways, Chris, in which people already living in this country, right. and in many cases born here, are being radicalised. But you wouldn't want to add to that problem, would you? I mean, I mean would you accept, you've Chris? You've okay. No, would you accept? You okay? <laughs> would you, you, ex been, would you accept that? An would you accept that Angela Merkel has made Germany a more dangerous place? Um, I wouldn't say she's made Germany um, a more dangerous place. I think what she's done has helped you get it across the line. But I wouldn't actually say she's actually made Germany a more dangerous place because you've got the far right in Germany, like you had the far right over here, like you had the far right in America. So I wouldn't, you know, be drawn on, on by uh, allowing you to lead me down a garden path like that. Because right, at the end well, of the day, well, Chris, you did well, Chris, go on a plane. You did go on a plane yourself, didn't you, and go to Germany and um, and give a speech, didn't you? So. Look, I think, I think what Merkel did was highly irresponsible. You see, I take the view, Chris, that when ISIS say, and when they said in 2015 they would use the migrant crisis across the Mediterranean to put their fighters into the European continent, probably they should have been taken more seriously. But, hey, Chris, we agree on some things, not everything. I thank you for your call. Um, and I've got, um, I've got a caller from Holmby Hills, Los Angeles, just down the road. David, good, oh, it's good afternoon here, isn't it? David, hello. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me on the show, Nigel. Not a bit. So, uh, Mr Trump is being stopped again, isn't he? Yes, he is. And I think people need to start waking up to the elite's agenda of, uh, for example, like you were talking about there with Merkel, where it's the elite looking to find <clears throat> copious amounts of extremely cheap labour at any cost. And it's the elite that don't have to live with the consequences of that uh, uncapped immigration. I, I, David, I completely understand that, for example, the free movement of people that we've been signed up into the, uh, up to in the European Union has been great for the rich and, and wonderful for big companies who employ lots of labour. I completely understand that. But don't you think the elite somewhere, David, are concerned about, to, uh, you know, increased terrorist threat or not? Well, the thing is, it was similar to the Paris vote. A lot of people voted for the same in Paris. They didn't really seem aware of the problems and the elite aren't the people that have to deal with uh with terrorism they don't take the metro they don't take the public bus uh they, you know they live far away in gated communities so they don't really understand the problems that people everyday people have to go through no that i i'm sure on a wider um immigration point that is a perfectly fair comment reasonable comment and the way that many felt who voted brexit in the referendum so you're a supporter of what trump is trying to do yeah well, I'm a supporter of uh, forward-moving action, and it's no, I've, I've lived all over the world. And based on being British, I've been allowed to enter certain countries, and I've not been allowed to enter certain countries. And there's nothing racist about it. It's just simple immigration policy. It's perfectly normal to have an immigration policy. Lots of countries do. I've lived in China. I've lived in Vietnam. They have their own set immigration policies. They, they have caps on certain countries, free movement on others, and that's just the way... That's the way the world works. David, international traveller from down the road in Holmby Hills, I thank you for your comments. Your texts and tweets coming in. I think the travel ban from high-risk countries is a good idea and it makes perfect sense, as long as homegrown terrorism is carefully considered as well. And yes, you know, there's an awful lot we've got to do to try and tackle radicalism at home, and we should never, ever forget that. We can't simply say the whole problem is immigration from here on in. Nigel, yes, I think President Trump is correct to bring a travel ban. Most people should be vetted. It just makes common sense, doesn't it? Says Cathy. Ben in Rochester is my next caller. Ben, should we, in the United Kingdom, be saying that certain countries pose a greater risk than others and go for some form of extreme vetting? Uh, unfortunately, my answer is I don't know. Um, I just think that, unfortunately, planet Earth has turned into this century a uh, has turned into one word, which is just fear. It doesn't matter who is in charge of the country, whether it's Labour, Conservative, or if I am, or you are tomorrow morning, there's just nothing we can do about it to stop um, 
extremism attack or terrorism in, in any parts of the world. And unfortunately, it's extremely frightening. Um, and uh, believe me, if, if it was anything we could do, we could jump at the chance. But it just seems to me there's there's nothing. Well, I mean, ben, that's not, well, not to say forever. But ben, I'm, I'm, I'm going to disagree with that. I mean, let, let, let's give you one example. Um, several hundred, 500 plus uh, British citizens have been out to Syria to fight with ISIS. And I was, very, you know, for the last three or four years, I've been saying we should not allow any of them back into the country, we should take their passports away. It turns out that hundreds have come back and we've only stopped, prevented one person from coming back into Britain. Surely, Ben, that's something the British government could have done to make us just a little bit safer. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. You know, and, 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 and I'm not pretending there's any magic wand over this, but I do think we have to be extremely careful. I think we have to learn from the ridiculous mistake that Angela Merkel made. And, and yeah, I'm not ignoring the problem at home. And I'm not pretending, Ben, we can solve this. This problem is going to be with us for decades and decades to come. But perhaps if we can do something to make ourselves a little bit safer, then surely that must make sense. But look, you know, I understand your point. There are absolutely no easy answers, no easy solutions. I thank you for the call. You're, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, live from Los Angeles, and it's 7.15. As President Trump is stumped once again by the judiciary, in this case, Hawaii and Maryland, stopping him, putting back in place his travel ban, I'm asking whether, particularly given what the boss of MI5 said yesterday about the severity of the threat that faces our country, whether it's time that we introduced some pretty strict vetting for people coming from certain countries in the world. Tom, in Manchester, is my next caller. Tom, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Lovely to talk to you. Yeah, you're a new caller to the show. You've obviously feel strongly on this issue. You're on LBC. Tell us what you think. Well, I agree with you, Nigel, insofar as the urgent need to prevent movement and things like that because obviously there is a, a transnational and asymmetric nature to the threat that we're facing in respect of terrorism. What I mean by that is it isn't simply a case of preventing people from country X into coming, into coming into our country because of course there are homegrown terrorists uh, yes, present yes. within our national borders. So I would agree with you insofar as it's important that we have strict checks at the borders to prevent anybody really from coming into our country but where our views would diverge and I say this respectfully, is I think it's important that we acknowledge that we can have as strict a checks as we like. It simply isn't the silver bullet that's necessarily going to deal with the threat that Andrew Park has referred to today, because, of course, the threat has changed. The tactics of these terrorists have changed significantly in the last few years, certainly since 7-7. We simply have people who are homegrown, perhaps have never been on the MI5 radar before, and are radicalised simply by reading social media. They go to their top kitchen drawer, they pick up a knife, and then they commit atrocities of the type we've seen in London and Manchester. Tom, I'm not disagreeing with you at all. I am not pretending that having very strict border controls, given where we are now already, is going to be some kind of silver bullet. I totally accept that. And there's another angle, Tom, to this too. Lorraine has just put a message on Facebook saying, there's a million illegals in this country. Who are they? So every night, we're told about 150 people get into Britain illegally on lorries through Dover and other ports around the country. So, Tom, we are facing a massive problem across the board. I totally accept that. I'm not pretending that this solves everything, but I do think if we do it, we might make ourselves just a little bit safer. Does that make sense? It certainly does, and I would concur with that. I agree, insofar as what I say is that we, if we have stricter checks and we have stricter vetting at the borders, it is but one tactic in our arsenal. Yeah. I would agree with you in that, as far as that much. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, I thank you very much indeed for your call. William is my next caller in Cambridge. William, is it time to get tough at the borders? Well, I think it is, Nigel, uh, fundamentally. I think that um, the issue with regards to migration is two-pronged. On the one hand, you do have the security um, it question, which has just been discussed. But on the other hand, I think there's a, a wider um, issue at stake, which is sort of national culture and national values, um, specifically those not only Britain, but also sort of, you know, Mother Europa more generally. And I think that having a lack of vetting, a lack of sort of cultural context, means that to have large numbers of large amounts of migration from those parts of the world whose values are fundamentally at odds to those who hold those here in Britain is a very dangerous thing indeed. And I think in a, in a society now where, for example, moral relativism is so prevalent, to have such, um, such 
volatility of, of, of um, such volatile ideas is, is, is a great threat to actually everything we, we hold to be dear as British people and as European citizens. Yeah, I mean, that's a, you know, you're, you're, you're broadening out the argument. I mean, in a sense, this is what Viktor Orban is saying, isn't he, who's the Prime Minister of Hungary. You know, he's saying, no, I'm not going to take uh, the migrant quotas to cover up for Mrs uh, Merkel's mistakes, uh, not only because I'm worried about security, but also because I'm worried about culture. I'm worried about large numbers of people, Muslim people, coming into Hungary, uh, whose attitudes towards women, uh, homosexual rights, whatever it may be, don't really fit in with our way of life. So it is a slightly separate debate, but I, William, I understand it, and, and, and uh, equally, people are very concerned about it. I thank you for your call. Mark says on Facebook, yes, definitely, because we are already the most densely populated country in Europe and live on a tiny island. Proof today was the news that billions of pounds are lost every year because of traffic jams and people being late for work, because our infrastructure can't cope with a rising population and the story he refers to is traffic jams on Britain's major roads have cost the economy around 9 billion sterling in the last year and left drivers facing delays of up to 15 hours data from transport uh, um, analysts have said uh, between August and September this year 1.35 million traffic jams I could go on but basically what they're saying is our population is going up uh, our transport times are getting longer and it's costing the economy dear. I remember once I was very late to a meeting in Swansea and I made a comment that I said I thought because of the rise in our population our traffic problems were getting worse and I was absolutely ridiculed and shouted down by the Liberal media as if I'd said something that was totally and utterly ridiculous. But you know what? It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But, but we're not talking folks here about mass migration, about open door immigration, that's a slightly separate argument. What I'm saying here is should we do what Trump's trying to do in America? Should we say that certain countries pose a much higher risk because they're currently going through civil war or ISIS is very prevalent there? Should we single out those countries and say we are going to put in place a form of extreme vetting that's going to make it very difficult, frankly, for almost anybody for those countries to get into the UK. That really is the question I'm asking you this evening. Jack is calling from Morden. Jack, good evening. Good evening. Hi there. Hi there. So, Jack, should do we get tough at the borders with people from certain countries, or is that wrong, immoral? No, no, I think it's, um, I think it's 100% right. Um, I think it's common sense. I think the opposition from the judges in the US is more so a matter of um, uh, vicious internal politics there than it is a uh, moral one. Uh, I don't believe that anybody um, who has any real common sense about them and actually stops and analyzes this from first principles um, could really come to the conclusion that, for example, uh, somebody from S Somalia um, uh, would pose um, equal uh, threat to somebody from, say, Canada. Because this is, if you if you talk in number of you know talking st statistics or or uh, belief systems, and you you, you can analyse this, I feel at any at any layer, and it's um, it's it, it, it's wow. just ludicrous to suggest that some of the countries on this list pose the same risk to us, say somebody from France or somebody from Ger Ger Germany. Well, at the moment, at, at the moment, Jack, that's true. Although if we did see a big increase in terrorism in France, we might have to think about that too. That's down the road. Jack, I think your point's right. And what, what I think those that are condemning Trump or perhaps condemning things I've said on this issue are missing is that it was Barack Obama, you know, the hero of the left, the one you all think's wonderful. It was Barack Obama that first put a list together and said, America must be careful. So, so Jack, I, I do think a lot of what's happening this side of the pond uh, is because, just frankly, tribal loathing of Trump, rather than looking at the issue, when, as I say, Obama put it in place to begin with. Jack, I thank you. Hattie is calling from Camden. Hattie, good evening. Uh, good e uh, evening there, Nigel. Um, never thought I'd be ringing you, um, but I just think it's ridiculous uh, to be putting so much emphasis on um, the impact that increasing security would actually have on reducing terrorism. I also found it uh, 
quite uh, hypocritical to hear talk of the fact that we don't want to see a shift in our culture caused by um, immigration from the Middle East in countries because, quite frankly, a lot of the problems we're seeing that are fueling terrorism are actually a result of our own semi-sort of invasion of Middle Eastern countries in the past where we went in there and we enforced our cultural values on them. I mean, take, I know this isn't the Middle East, but take Australia where we actually went in there and we tried to enforce assimilation of our own values on the natives living there. Um, I think increasing security and pinning down certain countries and saying that we're not going to allow these these immigrants to come in is simply just going to give their, uh, the, the groups such as ISIS fuel for their propaganda that they then bring to the, the countries we're in, well, the West. <coughs> well, Hattie, you think we've given ISIS enough fuel already in, in, in terms of the Iraq war and everything else, and by the way, a lot of people, I think, would probably agree with you on that. But Hattie, logically, and by the way, I'm not pretending this will solve all our problems, because it won't. We have, we've, we've had huge problems within the United Kingdom through a lack of integration in society and all those things but has he is it logical to think that people coming from as the previous chap said somalia may pose a percentage higher threat than those coming from france quite frankly no because i don't think that we're actually seeing immigrate uh, immigrants bringing the uh terrorism that's actually being used currently currently the terrorism is as a result of those living here home kind of bred terrorists that are looking at this propaganda coming in from ISIS online and frankly by saying we're not going to allow any Somalians to come into this country. If you're a, a Somali, uh, I don't know, student born here and you hear that, how is that going to make you feel, Nigel? If I said to you, right, everyone called Nigel is no longer allowed to travel, uh, yeah. how would you feel? You'd feel well, penalised. I mean... And quite frankly, if I then said to you, right, Nigel, here's a video showing what they're doing to all the Nigels out there. Look uh -huh. what they're doing. They're torturing you, Nigel. Uh -huh. And now they're not allowing you to travel. <laughs> they're, they're restricting... So your worry, Hattie, is... You have. Your worry is that if we do this, we'll alienate further people and drive them towards becoming bad people, yeah? Yes, definitely, 100%. Right. No, I understand that. And, by the way, we should remember that the attempted tube bombing the other week was somebody who'd come in as a, ref a child refugee through Calais. So there are a mixture of these things. Um, Hattie, I think we were slightly... We've been slightly insulated from from much of this um and and as i say that guy on the tube had come from calais he's the suspect that's the trial that will go ahead but we weren't part of the schengen zone so we perhaps haven't suffered this in quite the same way that other countries in europe have i repeat the point five of the eight people who were, who were involved in that atrocity in paris had come in through the southern borders posing as refugees but hassie you make very good passionate strong points on twitter i get not a travel ban but we should be able to turn back any Anyone who poses a threat. We should be in total charge of our borders. Yes, Jay, but we have to analyse why they're actually a threat. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, live from Los Angeles. It's 7.30. As the judges frustrate Trump yet again with his travel ban, I'm asking you, is it time we got tough at the borders and started to vet more carefully people coming from certain countries that might pose a bigger risk? But before that, as you know, I'm in Los Angeles, uh, where there have been some remarkable events taking place over the course of the last week. Of course, this all uh, comes around Harvey Weinstein, uh, royalty in many ways of Hollywood, uh, and he is now accused uh, by up to 30 actresses of uh, sexual misbehaviour up to and including rape uh, and indeed Game of Thrones actress Lena Headey is the latest star to accuse him of sexual harassment. Uh, he stepped down uh, from the board of his film company um, and now there are allegations against his brother too. Joining me to think about all this and what it means for Los Angeles, what it perhaps means for Hollywood and its reputation, is Francis Reed, British uh, reporter, living here in LA, been here for a year, working for Feature Story News. Welcome to the programme. Thank you very much. Did the, the stories about Harvey Weinstein, did it come as a shock to people living here in LA? Was it really a shock? Well, when the, when the story first came out, it was Meryl Streep et al., George Clooney. Everyone came out when the, the story about Harvey Weinstein first came out, and they said, goodness me, we had no idea. 
As the week went on, people said, are you kidding me? Come mm. on, this is Hollywood. This kind of behaviour in whatever form, maybe not as serious as the allegations, you know, we've been hearing, but in whatever form has been going on for absolutely decades. And, you know, the Academy booted him out, the BAFTAs in Britain yep. booted him out, yep. France tried to strip him of his Légion d'honneur, we'll see what goes on with that. The question is, how is this going to widen? You know, we've just heard, you know, allegations potentially coming out about his brother. Yep. Um, no, no. And Hollywood's gone very silent on this. Well, that's th that, that's the point, isn't it? Yep. What are they saying now? I mean, why have they gone so quiet? What have they got to hide? Well, this is what many people are saying. So we've got actresses, um, people like Oprah Winfrey even coming out today saying, you know, all the different allegations, saying this is a watershed moment, that this opportunity has to be seized to make real change. But actually in Hollywood, the movers and shakers, the, the uh, people behind the scenes, the big top management, gone very, very quiet. And people like Judd Apatow, he's a, a director and producer um, who's come out and said, guys, what are you all afraid of? What is it? There are too many skeletons that must be in some closets here. And why is it that no one's saying anything? Because if this was your wife, your daughter, your sister, surely you'd get behind it. Why aren't you getting behind it now? What are you scared of? I mean, we've seen these things happen. I mean, wherever there's big money and power, there are abuses of position. Of that, there's no question. It, it's ha it happened in the business world. We've seen it throughout the media world, too, in America. Absolutely. Over, over the course of the last year. But is there a specific problem here? I mean, one thinks of R Roman Polanski. Mm -hmm. uh, now we've got Weinstein. Uh, perhaps uh, some pretty big questions about Woody Allen and people like that. I mean, is this a particular particular problem for the film industry or do you see it as a wider problem in society in America? This is absolute I don't think it's just America, I think you could say Britain yep. I think you could say in any industry, from the film industry to medicine, to television to transport, you name it there will be women who will stand up and say I've, I've, you know, maybe not even been sexually harassed but held down in a meeting or whatever it may be and it's everyone's um, that you know, what they're saying here is it's everyone's responsibility to kind of come forward and make sure that isn't happening anymore, that's an outdated mode that's should never have been there in the first place. That's what many people are saying. However, if you look at Los Angeles, and Hollywood in particular, in every house in this city, on every street, you can find houses full of young people, um, models, aspiring musicians, aspiring actors, and that means that, you know, they've all come here to seek their fortune, to try to seek some success, and this city is hard. It's really hard. It's tough. And when people come here, they're suddenly, you know, they think they've come for the glitz and the glamour, and they get here and they suddainly find out, like sort of actually. Dick Whittington's yeah. of London paper gold. And, <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. and guess what? It's not that glamorous, and they've got to get on with <clears> it, and they've got to pay the bills, and suddenly they're in this situation where, you know, they have no money, they are the powerless or the more vulnerable, yes. and, you know, someone's coming to them saying, I can do this for you, but guess what? You've got to do that. You know, do they pay their rent? It kind of makes sense. But tell me, you've been here a year. Yes, I have. What's it like? Oh, it's terrific. You know, I mean, it's... It's a city which has many contradictions. It's a city which is made up of so many different cultures, so many different nuances. It is not one thing. It is not just Hollywood. Um, it also has great poverty in places. It also has great homelessness in places. This is a city which is so large and covers such a great span of life you are going to see all sorts of different things in this city. And it's also got a great climate and great beaches. Yes, it does. Yeah, have to say. that's the upside. I'm not that's denying the, it. No, <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for joining me. That was Frances Reid, reporter for Feature Story News here in Los Angeles, British reporter living here. She's been here a year. Um, I think perhaps explaining that this place is a magnet for young, aspiring actors, stars, models, and perhaps within that context and the money, you understand why some of these abuses take place. But I think the most significant thing that Francis said is that the silence of Hollywood right now over all of this is absolutely deafening. Thank you. Returning to our theme of is it time to get tough at the borders or would we be seen to be a horrible, nasty, discriminatory country if we did, I'm going to Ali in Hounslow. Yeah, hi there, uh, Thanks. Nigel. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Um, you know, I've always thought we should be careful um, in terms of who we let into our country. Um, I've, I've often, Ali, taken some real stick for saying it, but uh, what's your view? Well, um, really, you are 
um, speaking the truth in terms of we have to be realistic and at the same time pragmatic and see what's happening on the ground in these vulnerable nations. And um, the list of nations, they are majority are failed states or incredibly fragile states in which um, infiltration amongst um, active terrorist groups, whether it be Taliban, Al Qaeda, in um, in the Middle East or Al Shabaab are able to infiltrate and smuggle in explosive devices in planes and w- which could endanger um, Western citizens. So Trump policy is not discriminatory. And your one of your previous caller, what she said about, oh, a British um, citizen of Somali origin will find a sense of um, yeah. Donald Trump policy. I think it's totally um, wrong. She has no right to claim that she can speak in behalf of me. And it's typical leftist opinion of we know best, let us talk, you keep your mouth shut. And Donald Trump has been honest. He's been realistic and pragmatic. And at the end of the day, he's trying to prevent forms of terrorism. Just just this weekend, we, um, one of the, the, the most tragic terrorist attacks took place in Mogadishu, in which Al-Shabaab are able to infiltrate. Yes, yes. And again, they're the ones that pioneered laptop smuggling bombs in planes. So realistically, in terms of security point of view, and in terms of wider um, political po- point of view, Donald Trump policy is correct. Whether we like or not, whether it's I, not popular you know, or not, that is the truth. Whether he's popular or not is a separate issue. Uh, and there are great divisions, political divisions in this, in, in, in this country of America today, huge divisions. But the point is, I know... That the reason Trump is doing this is he sees what's been happening in London, in Paris, in Brussels, and says, I don't want any of this happening here. Ali, I thank you very much indeed. Uh, sounds like common sense to me, says Pete on Twitter. Terrorism is rife in Europe because of Merkel. The mass migration of refugees and terrorism is not all coincidental and therefore is relevant to debate, says Claire. Uh, But I get also on Twitter, this travel ban is an utter nonsense proposed by an unthinking blowhard holding appeal to the similar minded based on a myth that there's weak vetting in place. Well, there is something in that because actually America is one of the tougher countries to get into. I'm not sure getting into the UK has always been that tough over the course of the last few years. And Tina says, our border controls really need tightening up. We should be recruiting more staff, not cutting staff. And Tina, with Brexit, you know, coming up on the horizon, that's absolutely true. We would. Carl said it's crazy to have open borders all over Europe. It worries me that the EU doesn't want to listen. It doesn't want to listen because it takes free movement of people, open borders, and indeed its migrant policy as an article of faith. Jordan is calling me from Glasgow. Jordan, good evening. Hi, Nigel. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Is it time? Is it time to say these countries pose a threat? We're going to get really tough. The the simple thing to do is not to have um, religious screening, which I'm sure a lot of people, the first reaction is they think we're going to weed out all the Muslims. The main thing is that we should have ideological screening. People that share Western values about equality, equal rights, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, all that sort of thing, that should be always the deciding factor. That plus whether or not they have a criminal record. The country that they come from should somewhat be besides the point because the values are what matter, not the country or even the religion. Because I know a lot of people are afraid with things like ISIS, but important thing to remember, lots of people do point out that the vast majority of the victims of ISIS are Muslim. But oh, also, yes. when ISIS were pushed out of Raqqa yesterday, it was the Muslim Peshmerga that pushed them out, and it was the Muslim Iraqi army that pushed them out of Mosul. So um, it's really wrong to draw the distinction along those lines. But another thing I really want to take issue with is people always say that some of the terrorism that happens is our fault because of the invasion of Iraq. But that always sticks out wrong to me because the vast increase in terrorism happened before Iraq with the World Trade Center bombing in 93, the MC bombings in 98, the USS Cold. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, has he made that? Has he made that point earlier? Um, and it's a point Jeremy Corbyn has made. Um, and it may, um, it may have added to it. But Jordan, you're quite right. A lot of these things were happening before. Jordan, fascinating phone call. You're listening to the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, live from Los Angeles, and it's 7:45. As the judges once again frustrate Donald Trump on his travel ban, we're asking, is it time we got tough in the United Kingdom? But only fair to tell you, there is another almighty row blowing up in America right at this moment in time. And this is the story. Four American soldiers were ambushed 
in Niger last week um, and their bodies were on the way back to America yesterday. Uh, the president had written to the families of the four but had started to make some phone calls. He got on the phone uh, to Sergeant David L. Johnson's mother and wife were in the car. Also in the car was their local congresswoman from Florida, Frederica Wilson. And the congresswoman said she heard the president say to the pregnant widow that, uh, that Sergeant Johnson knew what he'd signed up for. You know, it's very sad, but he knew what he signed up for. And she says that you can say that in a conversation, but you shouldn't say that to a grieving widow. That is so insensitive. Trump, of course, has shot back on Twitter, denied the claim, said the Democrat congresswoman totally fabricated what I said to the wife of a soldier who died in action. And I have proof sad as he as he tends to end a lot of his tweets uh, but sergeant johnson's mother has come back and said that she was in the car and the statement is true so it's a row uh, not about the fact that the president uh, you know made the phone call wrote the letter did those things but it is a row about whether the language he used was insensitive or not and believe me we'll hear a lot more of that story over the course of the next couple of days danny makes the point to me on facebook yes remember clinton and obama started these bans first but it was okay then wasn't it absolutely danny because they're seen to be on the left of politics and that's fine and people hate trump whatever he does or some do um very interestingly we've got a phone call from tehran jamshid is calling me from tehran in iran good evening good afternoon to you hello there so are you a regular lbc listener all the time Right, OK, brilliant. Uh, brilliant. So, it how do you... Terror. Tell me, um, I'm, 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 I mean, we, we, had, we had a phone call from South Korea the other day, but this, this is the first phone call I've had from Iran. Uh, tell me, Jamshid, I mean, is it, in your view, is it totally unfair of Trump to put countries on a list and to make it very difficult for people from those countries to get into America? Yes, it's totally unfair. You know, painting the whole nation with one brush is the height of ignorance, Niger. I have lived in the UK for 47 years. I came to the UK November 1970 with 300 pounds in my pocket. Yes. I left the university. I visit, set up my business. At some stage, I had seven, eight hundred people working for me, British. And six years ago, I asked my accountant, you know how much tax I paid? He said, over two million over all these years. And I am no terrorist. No, Jamshid, it sounds like you've done remarkable things in your years in the United Kingdom, and that's fantastic. But isn't the point that when you came to the UK in 1970, you know, we hadn't had the Islamic Revolution that took place later in the 70s. Uh, we didn't face this global threat that we face today. The world was different then, wasn't it? Nigel, Islamic Revolution, Islamic government is totally misrepresented in UK. Listen, I have lived twice as long of my life in UK than in Iran, and I love UK. I owe UK everything that I have, and I live here, and I have business here too, and next week I live in London. But calling a country or a government 80 million people, you know, discriminating against them by a man that I can't even explain Oh, okay, I understand the argument and the passion with which you're putting it, and I understand that, but in an age of international terrorism, what do Western governments do to protect themselves from ISIS people coming in? The first thing is to stop Saudi Arabia funding all these terrorist groups. The Wahhabis yep. in Saudi Arabia funding all these terrorist groups, whether you call it Daesh, ISIS, 
Jepetal and Sar, whatever name they have. Yeah. Show me, tell me once, even once, that a country has been subjected to attack from Iran. No, I'm, I mean, look, look, I, I think I'm right in saying that Iran has probably the best educated populace of any country in that region. And going back in time, we've been allies. I understand all of that. Um, but but we can't deny that global terror is there and it's a threat. And I think you may be right, Jamshi, because I've been very critical of Saudi Arabia on this program. And yet um, our governments don't want to do much about that. It may be to do with defence contracts. Finally, Jamshid, let's end this fascinating call. Um, I want you to give me a message for President Trump. I really don't consider him worthy of a message. Don't he, you? He was, in, he was elected with the help of Putin Totally well, 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 we don't quite know that. We, we, we don't quite know that at all. Uh, that's an accusation. But anyway, Jamshid, your view is he's not worth talking to, yeah? Uh, I, uh, I don't give him any credit for anything that he's done. He's a four-time bankrupt. Well, and, I know all that. I know all that. He's had massive ups and downs. All I can tell you, Jamshid, as we speak... The Dow Jones is trading at 23,000. Wow. Jamshid, thank you. Fascinating phone call. Huge amount of passion there. Um, not surprisingly. Deb says, it's time to issue ID cards. Is it? I mean, am I going to be subject to being stopped on the street, going about my business and asked to show papers? I don't know, Deb. Maybe you're right. I've never liked the feel of it. Mike in Coventry is my next caller. Mike, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Um, I'll be quick. Basically, I don't believe that they need to put a blanket ban, but they need to put really, really strict policies on certain countries. Yes. Um, I, drive, I drive as a living. I drive in and out through Calais. Mm. Uh, back when the, the migrant camp was there last, to I still do it now, to seeing the migrants that are there now. And I'm, I'm a big lad. I'm not, not scared normally of anything, but these guys scare the life out of me. You know, things he... on the roads, lack of Mike, street lighting, so you can't see it. I drive, um, I've been driving regularly for the last sort of 15 plus years uh, through Calais, regular basis, going to Brussels, Strasbourg, etc. Um, and I remember a couple of years ago around the passenger area for the channel, you know, I had my car surrounded by people and they tried to open the door. And so I've seen a little bit of this, nothing like what you've seen. Is, uh, because they said they cleared out the camp, has it come back again? Definitely, you go if you get off the main motorway off the E40. Is if you're going up to the the uh, up to the, the ferry station. Yeah. There's a nice petrol station on the right with loads of trucks parked. Just stop there for thirty seconds, and your mind will boggle. So, if you think about it, Mike, however tough we are vetting people at the borders, if large numbers are coming in illegally, frankly, we're fighting a losing battle, aren't we? We are fighting a losing battle. Uh, I'll give the uh, UK border agency the due. They, they are more diligent now than what they used to be. The biggest problem is is when the French police or the Spanish police now, which is getting them out of Bilbao, drag them off the trailers, take them down the road and drop them off. <laughs> that, that's not, they're just going to go back and do it again, climb in the back of a fridge that's got medicine stuff in, say, or foodstuffs. The whole <laughs> of that lot's got to get yeah. thrown in the bin. And uh, there was one about a month ago, a driver got out here, some rusting at the back of his trailer, Brick to the side of the head, nicked his van, his Gosh. truck, stole all these personal belongings out the front. Very worrying. I uh, tell you, Mike, Mike, I tell you what, we all wish you well. Keep safe. Um, and, and, yeah, you know, it's all well and good dealing with people at our borders legally, but the illegal stuff does need sorting even further. I thank you. I thank everybody. You know, my final thought on all of this is that we do face a severe terrorist threat. The Director General of MI5 yesterday, Andrew Parker, could not have been clearer. We have huge problems within our own communities, huge problems in our prisons, through the internet, with radicalisation. We just m absolutely make sure we don't add to this in any way at all. And yes, I do think it's right, absolutely right, uh, that we should be tougher on some countries than others. I thank everybody uh, for their calls, texts, tweets, Facebook messages, opinions. I'll be back tomorrow evening from Brussels, where, of course, this big summit is going on that could determine, who knows, Theresa May's future. It's going to be certainly a big couple of days in Brussels. For tonight, coming up at 10...